Hello, Ashton, are you there? Hello, te testing. <clears throat> Ashish. Yeah, hi. Yeah, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm great. How about you? Very good. Very good. You been busy? Uh, a bit. Okay, that's good. That's good. How do you feel? How are things? Uh, very good. You know, I'm in. I, to me, I'm in. I'm in my the best of all worlds. I'm at my computer all day. I go to the gym every day. I mean, my life is great. <laughs> That's good. That's yeah, really good. <laughs> no, no, I hate to say that. I, you know, I hate, you know, it's a terrible thing that's going on, but uh, it, for me, it's not bad. That's very good. Yeah, as long as I can stay away from that pesky virus. <laughs> so how are you doing? You working and stuff? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Oh, really? Like you have a regular day or? Regular day. I've changed my schedule a bit. Okay. So what uh, basically what I do now is I previously I used to start my day at around 8, uh, 8.30 and then take a break at around uh, 3 or 3.30 and then again go to work from around uh, 5.30 till 7.38. Oh, are you seeing neurosurgery patients or all types of patients? No, I just see neurosurgery. Okay. So nothing it's, else. It's more or less a semblance of reality. Uh, yeah, I, I would say so, yes. Okay. Well, uh, has that improved lately or has the same been the same for a while? Uh, in sense. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. No, I'm just asking, in which sense are you asking that? Well, was it tighter a month ago and less patients or are you seeing more patients? I'm trying to get a feel if it's getting better or worse in your practice. In my practice here, currently it has gone a little bad because uh, sort of corona is uh, peaking here it's peaking yes okay uh otherwise the last six months uh, were uh, very good a lot of a uh, uh, lot of uh, complicated cases uh, and a uh, lot of learning and, uh, yeah that way it, it's been uh, it's been good, and the best thing is I am with my family. My children are here with me. Oh, good. So, truly speaking, uh, I have no complaints whatsoever. Is their school closed? The kids? Oh, my. <laughs> no, the, for the kids, are they going to school or no? Well, my eldest son, uh, he has finished college. And uh, he is now working as a financial automation. He's into financial automation at Amazon. Oh, good for him. And Amazon, my younger son, Amazon, uh, he's probably busy, right? Oh, yeah. He's working from home. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, and if my, any company's ready for this, they're ready. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And my youngest son, uh, he's in grade 12. So he's preparing for his uh, 12 and medical exam. Oh, OK. Yeah. Very good. OK, we got one minute. OK. Yeah, we have um, yeah another webcast after this. And then Ipe's having a webcast later on. Uh, the number of webcasts has decreased big, big oh. time. 
I want you to mean a kneel here. But it will, uh, <clears throat> certain days though, it's busy. Sunday, Friday. Hello, Anil Kumar. Anil. Hello, Anil. Are you there? You got to unmute. Just want to introduce him before we start. Hello, Anil. Well, we'll introduce him later. Okay, you ready to go? Let me, let me introduce you, okay? Yes, yes. Okay, 10, 9, 8. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Good morning. This is Dr. John Bennett broadcasting from Miami Beach, home of Neurosurgical TV. We have the pleasure of having Ashish Tandon, MD, a neurosurgeon from India, who is <clears throat> who's starting to do neuroendoscopy uh, in, in like an interactive setting. And he'll tell you what he's going to talk about today. Okay, Ashish, uh, I'll turn it over to you. It's all yours and welcome. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you, John, once again. And uh, uh, I'll quickly switch on my screen share. Is that on now? Yes, it's on now. Great. So uh, let me introduce myself briefly. Uh, I am uh, Dr. Ashish Tandon, and uh, uh, I'm working here at uh, uh, central part of uh, the country. It's called, uh, the name of the town is Jabalpur. Uh, it is a very vibrant city and a lot of uh, neurosurgical activity in here. Uh, is, uh, uh, let me, what is T M U H? My Q. T M U H. Mike, are you there? Anyone Hello. can answer. Mike is there from T M U H. Mm. Is it? Mm. Okay, okay. Well, anyway. So uh, I, I'll take you through the second part of uh, my lecture. Uh, the first part, uh, if you have missed on it, uh, on the lecture, then you can visit Neurosurgical TV. TV and uh, that I had focused mainly on uh, uh, transforaminal pure endoscopic procedures. Uh, today, I would be focusing on full endoscopic interluminal lumbar surgery. So, lumbar canal stenosis and uh, uh, lumbar discectomies, cysts, etc., etc. So, uh, uh, I think I'll uh, jump in right away. The, the pattern of this uh, talk today is please feel free to interrupt me anytime, anytime that you wish to. If you have a question, I'll be more than happy to answer. Uh, then uh, uh, there is a, a question answer uh, a sort of a, a box wherein you can type in your questions uh, or you can just unmute yourself and ask questions. Uh, the best thing would be to uh, not keep it to you and just you know sort of share or ask. Fine. So uh, these are the same set of disclosures that I had the last time. Only 30% of my uh, lumbar work is uh, transforaminal. Uh, rest 70% is interlaminar, which we would be speaking today. And when I speak of, when I talk of interlaminar, what I mean is pure endoscopic or full endoscopic or the tubular approach. So I'm, I do both. I am, uh, I'm in love with the tubular approach, though I would not be talking about it today. Maybe uh, the uh, some other day we will take up a talk on misty lift and tubular approaches. I think each one who's a spine enthusiast and MIS enthusiast should should learn the tubular approach. It has a very basic learning curve. It is not steep. You can pick it up very quickly. As far as interlaminar is concerned, uh, 
uh, I use the same set of uh, uh, equipments as for transferaminal discectomy. Uh, for canal stenosis, though, I use a larger diascope, but it's sort of shorter in length. Uh, I don't know why my cursor is not working today. Your cursor is not working? Uh, John, uh, just give me a minute. My cursor yeah, sure. is not working. So sure. okay. let me figure that out. Okay. Uh, just... We can all relate to technical problems. Yeah, the cursor is working now, it looks like. Uh, yeah, it's working in in this situation, but when I like, I can if I make the screen full, then the it, it sort of goes. Oh, can you see the this. cursor right now? Yes, I can see the cursor. Uh, can, can you see the cursor? Yes, we can see the cursor. Okay, that's it. So I'll just go this way. Let's see. Okay. Uh, so as I was telling you, for canal stenosis, I would tend to use a larger diameter scope, which is shorter in length. So that sort of gives me an advantage. The other disclosure is that I routinely perform MIS endoscopic surgeries. It forms bulk of my uh, operative work, MIS, as well as endoscopic, both cranial and spine. In fact, I started off with cranial, and that is uh, that has uh, sort of helped me understanding or moving from three anatomy to understanding two D anatomy because I'm I was trained basically initially in on the microscope, and then gradually uh, I picked up on endoscope. So uh, you, one has to get trained uh, to the anatomy. Uh, also, as uh, for uh, all surgeons, it's very true for me as well. I've had fair shares of my failures and complications, more so uh, in the initial learning curve. Uh, but as the experience has grown, uh, the number of complications, though they still happen, but uh, they have uh, the percentage has reduced. Now, this is where I would want to uh, really talk about uh, whoever is interested in pure or full endoscopic interlaminar uh, approach. Uh, you have to understand that there is a very steep learning curve. So when I say steep learning curve means you have to do a good number of cases to really get a hang of the instruments, of the anatomy, of what is good in your hands, so on and so forth. Uh, secondly, what I would want to tell you is, in my previous lecture, I told that transferaminal understanding the anatomy is difficult. There, there is a process of learning that because we are, have not been trained to go through the transferaminal approach. But as far as handling the instruments is concerned, because in transferaminal, the sheath is fixed in the foramen, you just need to move the endoscope and you can um, sort of perform the surgery. Here in interlaminar, understanding the anatomy is very easy because we are going through the interlaminar approach and we have been doing that uh, since we have started neurosurgery. But here, sort of uh, manipulating the instruments is uh, very difficult because in one hand, uh, and I'll show that, in one hand, you have the endoscope and the sheath, both. So you're controlling both of them. So sort of uh, getting a hang of the instruments is a little challenging. Then uh, what are the indications for interlaminar approach? Okay, so uh, I hope uh, nobody has a question 
as far as interlaminar approach is concerned interlaminar is like we are going right through the posterior midline okay unlike transforaminal where we are going from the lateral so what are my indications for uh, a pure interlaminar uh, endoscopic surgery it's specifically l5s1 disc prolapse i would not think or not attempt a transforaminal now i am very happy going with a full endoscopic for all l5s1 disc prolapse for l3 4 l4 5 or for lumbar discs which are calcified i'll go in for a interlaminar approach rather than in a transforaminal again a highly migrated disc which i would not be doing justice if i uh, went through a transforaminal approach i would pick in the interlaminar approach so if i go here this is a typical l5s1 disc all l5s1 disc i would attempt through a interlaminar endoscopic approach then uh, a highly migrated disc this like this is l4 5 and a highly migrated disc i won't be performing justice if i went through a transforaminal approach because not only would i be injuring the exiting root here uh, i may not be able to extract out this disc so uh, for a highly migrated disc i would go in for a interlaminar even if it is at l3 4 l4 5 then all calcified discs for me the minute you have a calcified disc i would not attempt it through a transforaminal there are few who may but in my hands i feel i am more comfortable doing a interlam approach uh the other indications uh would be lateral recess stenosis central canal stenosis spinal canal cyst now lateral recess stenosis and central canal stenosis again i am very comfortable using an interlaminar uh, over the top approach i'll share one of my videos with you wherein i will demonstrate that you can do a very very good job through a 8 or 10 mm incision so these are my indications for interlaminar approach okay now you have what i really want you all to is to understand the anatomy how it is different from what we are doing and the anatomy is not different it's our understanding what we need to look in the x ray and in the mri to sort of uh, uh, take a good approach take uh, better decisions so now look here this is a typical l5 s1 disc which is almost within the discal borders in in the sense this, the height it has not migrated superiorly or inferiorly fine this is the spinous process of l4 and this is the uh, sorry l5 and this is the spinous process of s1 now look at the axial cuts this is the higher cut so somewhere around here and this is the lower cut which would be somewhere around here fine now look here you have the lamina and the spinous process so when you are trying to attempt from here you would require to deal with this uh, lamina here to reach to the disc is that clear but suppose if i come here there is no bone there is no there is interlaminar ligamentum flavum direct so my endoscope sheath reaches to the ligamentum flavum direct there is no bone uh, in here okay so i'll keep on harping on this again and again so that you understand what you need to see on the mri okay so let's go on to the next photograph and look here why we select l5s1 so all l5s1 we can easily do through a interlaminar and this is a beautiful photograph a ct scan to demonstrate 
Now, suppose you have a disc herniation here and you want to attempt from a transforaminal approach. So this iliac crest is going to come in your way. So your sheath would be coming somewhere from here and it would be going down. Not a good, not a good trajectory, not a good approach. Now what God has done already ready made for us is, this is the disc here. There is a good interlaminar window. I just take my scope in here and excise the disc, period. Hardly any bone drilling. So for most of the cases of L5, S1, especially which are within, or I would say at the disc level or a little bit caudally migrated, you don't need any drilling of the lamina. However, if there is severe cranial migration, you may need to drill a bit of it. Okay. Uh, now I'll stop for a minute or so. If, uh, if the participants have any questions, they are free to ask me. If you have any questions till now, because I want you to understand the anatomy and what we are looking to it. Can you please maximize your uh, slides so we can see them clearer? Oh, 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 okay. I'm so sorry. So in that case, I have to have a... Uh, there you go. When I maximize it, my uh, cursor is not seen. So let me, uh, let me take okay. help. That's okay if you can't do it. That's okay. No, but I have to show, uh, John, I have to show those structures because okay. if I'm not able to show those structures, okay. uh, let me find out some other okay. way. Uh, then the other thing that I can do is I can take slide only. Has this increased the size? Uh, it looks about not the much? same. No, it looks about the same. You want to enlarge the slide, correct? Yeah, I want to enlarge the slide. Okay, on the, on the left-hand to... side, it has zoom, the si percentage on the le upper left. Try that. Uh, upper left, it says zoom, 119%. Maybe if you enlarge that. Yeah, uh, I, I'll, first, let me just try to get the uh, cursor. Let me just okay. try. Okay. I, I'll just try that first. So slideshow, show pointer when using, there we go. Well, okay. Learning the, learning the interface. <laughs> That's it. Now I have the cursor. Okay. Uh, friends, is that okay now? Excellent. Thank you. Uh, okay. Now, uh, so, uh, uh, so uh, I want you to ask specific questions. Okay, before, before I um, allow you that, just see the anatomy of L4-5 here. You see the interlaminar window here? Do you see? Yes. So yes. The, the issue with the interlaminar window here is the, the spinous process is coming a little down. If you look at S1 spinous process, it's flat, okay? So it is not obstructing in any way your uh, interlaminar window, okay? Secondly, the interlaminar window at L4-5 is not good. And usually uh, uh, there is hardly, you have to do bone work up to this point to really get the disc excision if you want to attempt a L4-5. So I would say, Straightforward L4-5 would be better dealt through a transforaminal approach. Now, why transforaminal over interlam in such cases? Because uh, we have data that transforaminal is the least invasive of all approaches. Okay? But uh, th that's absolutely true. Even in my practice, I find that if I do a decent, good, quick transforaminal approach, the patient himself wants to go home the same evening or, you know, uh, he wants to get mobilized pretty soon. Uh, on the other hand, interlam approach 
uh, any approach for that matter, a micro discectomy, a tubular, a distandu, or this, the full endoscopic, because we are going through the multifidus muscle, there is more pain and more invasiveness in the interlam approach. So whenever you can do a transforaminal for say for L4, 5, L3, 4, good. If you're not happy, comfortable or comfortable, then we can use the interlam approach. But I wanted you all to understand this anatomy because when you are approaching, when you are reading the MRI, you should be very clear in your mind how much of lamina you have to drill. And when you are shooting an X-ray and when you're keeping your instrument on the lamina, on the superior lamina, you should exactly know how much lamina you want to drill. All of this, uh, it'll be, uh, you can, you would be able to understand as my slides progress. But still, if you have any question till now, please feel free to ask. Let me just say, you also can text any questions. Feel free. If you don't want to go on video, just text the questions or comments. Okay. None so far. Okay. Okay. So let's go on to the... Okay, so I have discussed the anatomy with you. Now I would discuss the technique. And as I told you, L5-S1 disc herniation is, uh, is the main uh, area where you are going to use full endoscopic. You don't need any different set of equipments. The same, I use the same scope. So you don't need to invest more money on any fresh uh, instruments. And uh, the only thing is uh, you need a little more height. Uh, I, I'll show it to you in some photographs. So this is the uh, uh, L5-S1 disc herniation. How I position, this is a very short video. So what I do is I flex. So there is flexion and There is reverse trend. So basically I break the table. Okay. Um, once again, if you see the flexion is going to increase here. See the flexion is increasing and why? Now there is a scientific reason for this one you are decreasing the lumbar lordosis that you really want. You don't want a lot of uh, lumbar lordosis. So uh, uh, you're making it a little flat. And secondly, you are opening up the interlaminar window. Okay. So how does the interlaminar window open up? So let's see this video. You see, this is the facet joint. And when you are flexing, look at the interlaminar window here it is increasing. So you need less of bone drilling. So it's not about just drilling the bone. It's also about the time consumed because you have smaller instruments while you're doing endoscopy. And endoscopy or minimally invasive surgery is all about being more and more precise. Okay. It's like just going to the pathology, dealing with the pathology and coming out. That is, uh, 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 in a nutshell, the whole uh, ethos or crux about MIS. So for MIS, you need to have the right position. You need to have the right set of equipments so that you know what you're dealing with. Okay. Again, I'll show you this video. So, Sorry, 13 second video. So when you are positioning the patient, you, you get a better interlamp window. Fine. Now, once can the I patient ask, is... Can I ask a question? Yes, yes, yes please, please, please. I, I noticed from your position that you are putting the patient in prompt position without anything under his abdomen. 
no, no. Or you, or, is, you are, uh, or you are keeping a Wilson frame. This is, uh, I use flat bolster. This is, this black thing is yeah. my flat bolster here. Here and on the opposite side. Ah, okay, so uh, the, abdomen, this, the abdomen is free. Yeah, abdomen is absolutely free. It needs to be free. And also, okay. uh, you have to be very, very cautious here because, uh, see, in open or in tubular approaches, you have a lot of ways to control the bleeding. I mean, the venous bleeding or bleeding secondary to raised intra-abdominal pressure. Okay. Which you, here you have very limited opportunities. So, uh, and I would also advise all of the youngsters that even for a disc, when you're doing initial few cases, get the blood pressure lower down, get the peak pressure on the ventilator lower down, use Trenexa, because I feel Trenexa has helped me decrease the bleeding, no abdominal pressure, so that your surgery is more smooth. Fine. What is Trenexa? Uh, tranexamic acid. Tranexamic acid is, uh, is um, if I tell you technically, it prevents the, uh, it inhibits the uh, fibrinogen degradation. So the clot that is formed does not degrade. And so there is better hemostasis. Okay. If you read recent papers, we have, I have been using Trenexa for more than three to five years in all my complicated spine. So all pedicle screws, trauma, my uh, deformities, I would be using tranexamic acid. But now there is a recent benchmark paper uh, uh, in, new, uh, in one of the neurosurgical journals which suggests that even in head injuries, whenever the patient comes to you, especially if he's coming early in transfused tranexa so that his clot contusion does not increase. Well, that is apart from this. So this was a little bit on Trenexa. So what, uh, what I wanted to uh, uh, tell my uh, viewers is that use each and every way to decrease intra bleeding. Okay. Uh, I don't know whether you are able to appreciate here. Generally, I keep the mean arterial pressure between somewhere around 70. Okay. Somewhere around 70, I keep uh, that. That is the best uh, that I feel. Okay. Okay. This I have shared. This I have shown. Okay. Now, uh, when, um, when um, I start uh, uh, my uh, marking, what I do is I take a K wire. And my K wire, as you can appreciate, is somewhere near the middle part of the disc. And like this patient had a left sided disc herniation, or, or right, I'm not sure right now. So, whichever. So, I'll just be a little medial to the lateral window, the lateral interlaminar window, because the whole action is going to be here. Okay. So this is where I need to dissect. Okay. So once I have marked this, I place a incision and okay. This again, I would like to show the uh, preparation. My assistant has already prepared the endoscope. I am giving an incision here. <coughs> this, uh, this is a spinal sheet. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of water that would be, uh, you know, coming in because it is again surgery being done under irrigation. So the irrigant would be falling down here into the uh, into the dustbin. Okay, and one of my assistants is standing on the opposite side. He or she would be feeding the instruments into the endoscope. Okay. So uh, I would make, a, if I'm using a smaller scope, an eight millimeter uh, incision. And I'll take the incision till the fascia. And here I directly use the dilator. 
just I go right in into the interlaminar window. Here again, you have for the beginners, uh, what you can do is instead of really going in and then puncturing the ligament and the and injuring the dura, you can try to hit any of the bone. You can try to hit the lower lamina or you can hit the upper lamina. Okay, I will suggest to hit the lower lamina and uh, ligamentum flavum border. Okay, but you can choose either whichever you are comfortable with so that you know that you are not injuring the ligamentum, you are not creating a dural rent, and you know your apprehension is not increasing. Okay, so. There's a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, yes, yeah, yes, John. So here I, I have my uh, sheet. Once I, uh, sorry, my dilator, and uh, once I have uh, fixed my dilator, I would shoot an X-ray. So I'll just uh, take a uh, few of the questions. T M U H. Yes. Uh, so what is T M U H? Is it Technical University of Munich or I'm not sure what T M U H is. Uh, if lumbar vertebra is sacralized, then what we use? Well, if it even if it is sacralized, you have to see the the ella of uh, uh, sorry the uh, iliac crest. If your disc herniation level <coughs> on an AP X-ray, if the iliac crest is above it, and you feel that transforaminal is difficult, go through an interlam approach. So that you can decide based on the x-ray. You don't need to worry whether it is lumbarized, sacralized. You just see the iliac crest and take a decision. That's number one. Uh, it's Ninad has, yes, it's an antifibrinolytic agent. Uh, do you use IV or local? Altaf has asked, okay. So uh, uh, Altaf, if you read uh, certain papers on Trenexa, you will find that you start with a bolus dose of 10 milligram per kg. So for me, for a 70 kilo patient, I would usually, uh, in my anesthetist would give a gram of Trenexa. And thereafter, I use one milligram per kg per hour. So a continuous IV. That's number one. Number two, when my uh, juniors and assistants are closing, when the dura has been secured, closed, uh, uh, or if the dura has not been opened in uh, 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 where the bony work is only done, then what we do is we put in the drain and we inj uh, uh, not inject, we just flush, flush the wound with local trinexa and we allow it to be there for three to five minutes. So in that three to five minutes, either we'll be putting the drain or we'll be, uh, you know, uh, securing hemostasis, things like that. And once three to, or injecting local into the wound. So we use those three minutes and I, I, I can vouch for it that your bleeding reduces a lot, maybe by 60 to 70%. So please use it regularly. It is a wonder drug. Till now, there are certain uh, caveats though. You, you should avoid using in cardiac patients. There, there is one or two more, I think DVT patients, so on and so forth. So um, uh, I think, uh, so I use both IV and local. Uh, okay. What is the skin landmark for skin incision? Well, I, I've already told you Harshad, that I put on AP, I just put a, a K wire in the midline. So my point, the end of the K wire is reaching to the spine. Suppose this is the spinous process on an AP. I'll be touching just lateral to the spinous process. Okay, just lateral to the spinous process. I'll try to be 
bang in the center of the area of disc herniation. So I will see the MRI. On MRI SATCH, I know the center of the disc herniation. So let me, uh, you've asked a very good question. So suppose this is the disc herniation, okay? So what I would try to do is, this is the center of the herniated fragment. So I would try to be here, okay? And in L5-S1, generally you will find that we bring the sheath and trocar from below and up. It is easier to go up rather than come down, okay? So that's about this. Uh, I hope, uh, Harshad, I've answered your question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, yes. Okay. Uh, uh, now, so I use a longitudinal incision, not a transverse incision. I use a longitudinal incision, which is around eight millimeters. Are you using easy go system? No, not at all, Kesar. It is a full endoscopic. So when you use a use easy go, there is a tube. That is what I call tubular. You are calling easy go. That I use only for missed T lifts or when I combine a Wilsey approach with decompression. So that is where I use easy go for disc knees and single level stenosis. I would use a, a full endoscopic and I'll show you the video. So, so it will become clearer. Okay. <clears throat> Does Trenexa infusion increases the risk of DVT? I, I think so. There must be an increased risk. And uh, that is why in, uh, in certain group of patients or cardiac risk patients, it has to be avoided. Or maybe you can reduce the dose. Please explain how uh, to do skin mark. I think I've already explained. If still you have uh, any more question or if you have not understood, then I'll explain it once again. <clears throat> okay, fine. So I, I think let's move on. Okay. Now, so see, this is my uh, incision. It's a longitudinal incision. This is the draping that I do. It's a very small incision. This is, I don't use needle. Though if you, if you want, you can use a needle first and this sheath will go through the needle. Uh, so here, and I'm just feeling uh, here, I think I'm feeling the bone. Okay. And after that, I use a sheath. Now this, th this is a bigger sheet that I'm using, bigger dilator and scope. As I told you, I use two, one is eight, uh, in fact, 7 mm uh, scope and the other is 9 mm scope. So here the sheath is going over the dilator. I'm sorry, okay. I, I need to mute. Okay, now this is the endoscope. Now look carefully. Uh, is it a video? Okay, yeah. Now see my assistant here, sorry. My assistant, this, this here is the irrigation fluid that would be attached to one similar port on the other side. So he is attaching the irrigation. Again, I'm not using pumps. I use gravity, but if you want, pumps are very good, especially if it is bleeding. Here I check the white balance uh, and uh, the focus, zoom, left, right, this is a 25 degree forward looking scope. Now, in my last lecture also, I had um, discussed about this, that in endoscopy till now, wherever you need to do procedures, 15 to 25, 30 degree scopes are best for performing procedures. Why? Because when the instrument comes in, you are able to see the instrument first. Okay. And then you can sort of target the neural structure. So be it ETVs, I use 25 degrees, colloid cysts, 25 degrees, intraventricular tumors, for CP angle tumors, for all types of spine that I do, I would use a 25 degree scope. Okay. Uh, I use a high definition camera system. 
uh okay now this is very very important okay so as far as interlaminar technique is concerned there is nothing to anatomy you know in easy go system or distando or micro discectomy you are seeing from behind so if this is the theca there is ligamentum flavum here and you see from above you cut the ligamentum flavum see the theca root and do the surgery very similar for interlam as well but here this is not a fixed system neither the sheath nor the scope is fixed it's a joystick okay it's a joystick you can take up down you know so that is why there is a steep learning curve to handling the instruments and now please understand that how to hold the scope so these fingers here sort of help me keep the sheath inside <clears throat> and my thumb is thumb and the rest of the hand is holding the scope and from the other hand i put the instrument in so here if you can appreciate and at times when you feel that you know you need some support you can ask your uh, assistant but usually it is not required and the assistant is helping you in feeding the uh, instruments now uh, also uh, the irrigation is controlled through this switch here if if i want to speed up like when i started off i used to use almost 30 liters of fluid and then gradually it has come down because now we understand when to increase the pressure or when to decrease it so on and so forth the other thing i would want you to look at in this photograph is uh, is these two bottles now this is a 3 liter irrigation bottle and this is a 1 liter irrigation bottle wrapped with a pressure uh, system so i use this typically and there are controls and this i use when there is lot of bleeding and i want more pressure the irrigation to be more so that is the time when i use this okay so uh let's move on okay so uh, the, the as i have told you the instruments remain the same you have the same bipolars they work very well under the irrigation not a issue okay now for l5 s1 disc as i told you this the the dilator comes here and it is sort of i have established it near the bone and then i have taken i am taking the sheath in and the dilator has been removed so this is how you sort of dock now what i'll do is i'll start sharing few of my videos they are also on youtube or uh, uh, here as well um, and you can sort of go again and again and uh, review these uh, videos so this was a hard disk uh, a hard and large disk and this is a, a good disk herniation with caudal migration here you can appreciate a uh, left sided uh, disk okay now look here this this is the sheath okay the scope is inside the sheath because that is why you are able to see part of the sheath this here is ligamentum flavum at l5 s1 level okay fine here i am using a through cut or a ligamentum flavum cutter the important thing to learn here is that when you are cutting unlike in open surgeries or microscopic microscopic surgeries where we cut the ligamentum flavum in one go so we take the whole ligamentum flavum and we punch it then we take another the complete thickness of the ligamentum flavum and we cut it here we cut it in layers okay so here i am cutting the as you can appreciate i am cutting the ligamentum flavum in layers
here i have opened the ligamentum flavum and you can see the uh, fat so this i have opened up now this is a very small opening in the ligamentum flavum so why is it small because see the sheath in itself is a 8 mm sheath and this opening in the ligamentum flavum is about 1/3 or so and i have stretched it so by about 2 to 3 mm of opening of the ligamentum flavum you can go inside the ligamentum flavum you can expand and you can go inside that is the advantage of interlam approach a pure endoscopic or full endoscopic interlam approach that the uh, lubricancy of the epidural tissue is maintained can you close the the lubricancy because there is less of fibrosis this is uh, maintained okay so here you can see that i have opened the ligamentum flavor okay what i am doing here is i have taken my sheath inside and this is a long sort of a dissector and i am separating the root from the edge of the facet okay medial edge of the facet sorry okay so i'm pushing the root aside and now what i have done is as i showed you the sheath the last time in transfer hymenal it is a beveled sheath so initially my opening of the bevel is towards the theca medially but once i have dissected i turn the uh, uh, sheath so that the longer part is acting as a root retractor okay oh, oh. trying and again okay so here i am using this as the root retractor my sheath opening up the annulus and then there is nothing more to it just remove the disc okay as we do the advantage here is you can very well go inferiorly and superiorly to confirm that you have done a complete job you know here like i am i am visualizing the s1 root and i can see that there is no fragments and i can bring i can take out the sheath and you know confirm that all the roots and theca are free okay so these are the root and theca this is part of the axilla here and you get a very beautiful view uh through this approach okay and this was the large single fragment that had come out apart from other fragments and here what i am trying to show you the extent see i here i have gone to the lower part so my instrument is gone here the sheath and here if you can see my uh electrode rf electrode is reaching almost to the upper part so i am pretty sure <coughs> that you know uh, through an x ray that you know i have covered the whole extent radiologically as well these are the set of instruments that i use uh okay so i'll again take up few questions if there are because i i think you must have absorbed the surgery so let's see what what's the question if ligamentum flavum is thick or calcified okay so no problem if if if, if it is thick you can deal with uh, it very similarly it doesn't matter and because i would be showing you one of the videos of canal stenosis as well so uh, wherein you generally find the ligamentum to be very thick and buckled you can very easily deal with it as far as uh, uh uh as far as uh, what was the question calcification of the ligamentum flavum so if it is calcified then uh, you if you require to do use drill you can use drill or you can be a little patient go around and you can cut it what do you do when there is an accidental csf leak okay fine 
Now, if you have an accidental CSF leak, wherein the roots are not herniating out, and you, in fact, I'll, I'll pose this question in a different way. If, if you have a dural cut, but the arachnoid is intact, nothing to worry. If the arachnoid has been breached as well, and the roots are coming out, if you're able to push it in, just push it in, stop the uh, irrigation for a while, get the gel foam in and you can come, come out. If you have made a major, uh, if you have done a major injury, then obviously you will need to convert it into a micro approach, okay? And uh, I, what I would suggest is do not hesitate in converting it into a micro discectomy uh, so that you are able to do a good repair, especially in your initial few cases. Uh, you know, uh, the mistake I used to make in my initial few cases was that I used to think that I am at the shoulder. So suppose if this is the, how, how, how do I show you? If this is the root and this is the theca, so this is the traversing and this is one of the roots. Generally, we take the dissector here and push it to get to the disc. What I was doing was I was coming in here and as I was retracting, there was an element of injury to the dura. So the, uh, the important tip or trick that I can give you is that in all cases, especially L4, 5, L3, 4, you have to drill the facetal part, the ascending facet, so that part of it, so that you can really go lateral. You know, you can really go lateral. I'll take you to that uh, slide where I can show you what I, I'm sorry, I'm going in back and forth. Okay, this was the slide. Now look here, see, if you have to drill a part of uh, the bone here, do not hesitate to get to the lateral margin of the root and the theca. That's very important. More so in L4, 5 and L3, 4, as I told you, see, <clears throat> look at the opening here and look at the opening here. So here you will have to drill a part of the bone here and you have excellent burrs which are available. Uh, I use a very uh, Indian sort of uh, uh, drill. I use a manman to attach and I do the drilling. I'll show it to you. You can use all sort of fancy drills. Okay. Uh, what do you do when there is a, okay. In my experience, just gel foam closure invariably leads to CSF leak. Yes, you're absolutely correct. Uh, there is uh, a good chance that with gel foam, uh, there would be an element of leak. But you have to understand that here, when you are removing the sheath, the defect that you have created is so tight that the amount of CSF leak to happen is much less than we what we see with tubulars and with uh, open approaches, micro discectomy approaches, because the Water has a lot of uh, real free space to, you know, <coughs> I'm sorry, free space to uh, exit. So the chances of CSF leak is uh, higher with an open approach. With, with these approach, if you have a small leak, then you may, uh, you know, uh, you may not require to do anything. So in, in if I look at my numbers in maybe around 10% or 15% I would require to convert if there is a CSF leak. Otherwise, generally I do a good skin suture, make the patient uh, lie down for uh, uh, 48 to 72 hours and the patient is fine. Okay. But uh, this, this uh, the, I, I would say that you can take a call case to case. Uh, if you want to sort of... Uh, open up, you can open it up, or maybe you can uh, watch for 48 hours and then take a call. Okay, uh, why are you using RF electrode? Okay, RF electrodes are being used for two or three reasons. Uh, 
The first reason is these uh, RF bipolars are long and they are flexible. So you can take them to any direction once you are inside. So they will sort of bend. So that is number one. Number two, RF I use at four megahertz and there are 4.5, 6 megahertz. They work very well. The electrical transmission is very low and chances of injury to the root is very less. So that is why RF has become more and more popular. It is also very effective underwater, though all bipolars work very well underwater, but RF works extremely well under water. Uh, okay. So if there are no further questions till now, then we'll go ahead. So this is Geet here. I had a couple of questions, if you please allow. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please, please. Uh, sir, as you said, uh, the RF is flexible and long. However, if... Oh, uh, yeah. Hi, Geet. Yes, sir. Geet, Geet Gupta. Yeah, hi, hi. So, if there is a bipolar which is again a, a, a semi flexible and 30 centimeter long, let's assume which fits your scope, uh, plus reusable, uh, autoclavable reusable, will that solve a purpose or still? Oh, uh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, basically, uh, when we say RF, uh, uh, RF, we, uh, we more often than not mean the machine which is generating the RF right, and not just the probe. So if the probe is reusable, uh, then a lot of money can be saved. And uh, uh, we also, uh, what I have through my experience learned that when we are using RF, uh, the electrode, and using normal cautery machine, the life of the electrode is very less, sort of tends to burn away. <clears throat> Whereas when, when we are using a reusable uh, RF uh, or bipolar, then you can connect it to the various types of cautery machines that are available with us. So that is a big leap uh, as far as uh, surgery is concerned. So thank you, Geet, for raising this point. Uh, Thanks, sir. I have uh, two more basic questions, sir, if you allow. Yeah, yeah please. Uh, the shape of the sheet, sir, uh, one is straight cut, the second is oblique, and the second one is U-oblique, the, the double oblique one. Which one do you prefer for uh, interlaminar approach, or you use more than one sheet uh, depending upon type of case? Okay. So... Uh... If, if I am doing, I'll clarify the question for the interest of the other participants. What he is asking is, do I use a single sheet or do I use two sheets in the sense one big for doing say stenosis and then for a discectomy, I bring in another sheet. So th that is what his question is. And as I told you, there is a bevel. So he, there are different types of bevel. So... Uh, the other question is, uh, uh, what type of bevel do I use? So for canal stenosis, if it is a severe canal stenosis and I need to do a lot of bone work, or if it is too level, then I would definitely go in for a bigger sheet first and then take in the smaller sheet. However, if it is a single level stenosis, single disc, not a lot of problem, uh, then I can do everything through a eight millimeter scope. I don't need to get in like what, what scope you can see here. Uh, this, uh, I can very well do everything single level beads, stenosis over the top decompression <coughs> foraminotomies. I'll show you a video where I've done a foraminotomy uh, and I will expose both the roots. So that, that all is possible. Uh, through just this scope. But if we are discussing about the scope, you will see that look at the height of my assistant and where am I? Because I am standing on a small stool. Why? Because this is an 18 centimeter long scope. And generally, <coughs> 
when you are doing an interlamp, there are a little smaller size scope by about three to four centimeters. But I don't think so. Just for that much, you need to uh, uh, sort of uh, purchase another scope. Or, so that, that's what I feel. The other thing, uh, if, uh, if the participants can observe here, look, look at my shoulder. If I continue using my shoulder like this, it is going to fatigue. In any case, my thumb is going to fatigue. My hand is going to fatigue because of the grip. So you have to see <coughs> that the table height is as low as possible to, you know, so that your shoulder height is not like this. It has to be 90 or less so that you, you know, this does not get fatigued. Okay, but I, I think we are going into too many intricacies, but still these are very valid points, very valid questions which need to be answered. Now, uh, Harshad has asked one more question. Do you advise complete disc removal? If disc is hard or fibrous, what do you do? Well, uh, by complete disc uh, removal, what, uh, I, what I remove is free fragments. So I would remove the herniation and the free fragments which are lying within the disc. So free nucleus pulposus part. But I am not doing a end plate to end plate discectomy. That is not required, not advised, lot of back pain. So you are converting a simple case into a complicated case. As far as disc is hard, is, uh, hard we have good, uh, you know, uh, trefines with this set. So you can just trefine the disc or you can use a chisel. That also is uh, available. Or you can use... Uh, uh, drills. Drills may not be that safe, but you can use chisels. You can very well use trifines. Okay. So let's move on. Uh, okay. Okay. Now have, I've shared this with you, right? Okay. Instruments. Okay, this is another case, just to demonstrate. Uh, this is a L45 disc here. And uh, I chose this because in few cuts, I felt that I may need to excise the ligamentum as well. I've shown you these instruments. I use the sheath with the scope. Again, here I brought this video to show you that in L4 at L45 level, you have to use a drill uh, uh, or a burr. Here I am uh, retracting the root. And again, you will see the rotation of the sheath. So I have rotated the sheath here. And then finally, I am removing the disc. Now, these are fine instruments and you really need to handle them with care. They are costly and you don't want them to break. So uh, you can use a lot of trefines and, uh, uh, you know, dissectors first, free up the fragments so that the life of your instruments uh, increases. Also, if you can appreciate, because you are viewing through a 25 degree forward view, so you are able to see under the root, okay? You can see under the root. And in microdiscectomy or in tubulars, when we find that, you know, removing under the root, anteriorly, you're not able to visualize. Here, you see, you can visualize it very well and you can take your instrument and uh, peel it off. Okay? So this was post-discectomy. This was the fragment here. Okay, this is another case. There, there was an element of uh, severe stenosis in this lady here. There was ligamentum flavum along with a large disc. So <clears throat> this is what I had done here. So I have removed part of the lamina. I have removed, I have done over the top decompression of the opposite side uh, uh, a little bit of the lamina and facet. I have removed the part of the spinous process. So the base 
and you can appreciate here as well and here you see i have cut the spinous process here i have drilled it and uh, from here to here the uh, ligamentum flavum has been excised and this is the post op scan <laughs> after discectomy and decompression this is immediate almost around 8 to 10 hours so there's some element of fluid in there this is the post op post op and here i'll take a few more minutes uh, okay so same case i'm discussing yes we can see it okay so so the sheath is in uh, this is the uh, bipolar or rf electrode this is malleable uh, and uh, i am going through the uh, right side i think i forgot it okay so uh, i'll first show you the video un uninterrupted so i'm using the drill here to drill the lower part of the upper lamina and part of the sap the medial part of the sap so i'm creating more space here i am drilling the spinous process once the spinous process has been opened up i am opening up the ligamentum here because it's a case of canal stenosis i've used a bigger scope and i am using the typical kerosene rongers and full thickness uh, ligamentum flavum excision okay here i am going inferiorly <clears throat> this i am going on to the opposite side here i am doing a foraminotomy of the left side so i am going bang opposite here you see this is the foramen here see look at the beautiful foramen now i must tell you i have been doing tubular approaches for more than 10 years now and over the top such a beautiful demonstration is very very difficult or not possible through the tube uh, so i feel this is a beautiful uh, uh, you know technique for over the top decompression of stenosis so here i am uh decompressing this is on the right side so ipsilateral side this is the theca now what i have done here okay the part that has been missed here is in between these two steps i have changed my sheet so from a bigger sheet i have come down to a smaller sheet because i want a smaller sheet so that i don't retract this root too much if i have a big sheet there will be too much of retraction which i don't want that is why i changed the sheet and then the scope as well so here the root is being separated the sheet has been rotated this is the trephine i am using to open up then the discectomy then i would be decompressing the axilla as well here you can see the axilla so this is the exiting root and the axilla inferiorly again this demonstration is also very beautiful through the pure endoscopic approach so the root here root here the complete theca is free opposite root has been decompressed i have gone right from this part then discectomy lower down a 10 mm incision and uh, this is the post op which i have already shared with you okay right so yeah fine great so i think uh, i've covered the basics and some uh, some some advanced points as well, as far as uh, uh, pure interlaminar is concerned endoscopic approach uh, i'm extremely thankful once again uh, to john 
for this opportunity and to all of you for uh, uh, watching this presentation. And I hope uh, uh, you are able to take up this uh, approach. Uh, I, I would be more than happy to uh, answer the questions if there are any. Yeah, okay. Questions. There was one question I thought. There was one Go ahead. question. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, it's, we always work at shoulder. Okay, Nina, uh, see, uh, okay. There is, if you go into literature, this, you know, I have just come across maybe around six months back. There is something, and I think it's from an Indian author. Uh, it's been published. Uh, I'm forgetting the journal. It is called the kissing sign. Kissing sign. Here, if you have a kissing sign positive, it's an axillary disc. So you can go right into the axilla and remove the disc. <coughs> and then go to the shoulder. But uh, uh, in for me, 80 to 85%, I'll go to the shoulder first, like we do in a tubular approach or a micro discectomy, and then remove or decompress the disc, loosen out the uh, root and theca, and then do more of mobilization. Though I must say that uh, uh, dealing with axillary discs is much easier through this through this approach. Very good, uh, Neil. Uh, we have to wrap it up. Excuse me, uh, Ashish. We have to wrap it up now. We have another, but we had a good good interactivity. If we keep working at it, we're going to get better and better. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think they can post their questions to me on uh, the email or through you, and uh, or they can call me. Uh, I would be more than willing to answer their questions. Okay, maybe put, so your, posting, put your email address in your chat in the chat there. That might make it blue. Yeah, I am putting my email address as well. Yeah. So it's Dr. Ashish at gmail.com. And the site would be www.advancedneurosurgery.com. So you can contact me here. Uh, thank you once again. And I think we have another presentation. So I'll take your leave uh, as a speaker from here right now. Thank you so much. OK, Ashish, we'll wrap it up and we'll see you next week and any any particular topic uh, next week you have in mind uh, i i think let me talk on miss t lift uh, uh will say and miss t lift approach this would be sort of an extension of the endoscopic so it will cover the spectrum and i'll try to speak on that okay very good so we'll see you next week yeah yeah thank you thank you so much okay we're going to continue on here we have another presentation uh, by uh, Neil Kumar Sharma, a physician from uh, the Ames chain in India. Hi. I haven't met Anil. How are you doing, Anil? Hi, John. How are you? Good, good. good. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, a lot of people don't know what the Ames hospital chain is. Uh, it, it, I, it's my understanding it's nine or ten big hospitals spread out over India that are kind of like the backbone of healthcare in India. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, that is correct. That is correct. Uh, this, uh, thank you, Dr. Asis, for wonderful presentation. And uh, thank you, John, for creating this uh, platform, wonderful platform for knowledge sharing. Uh, let me, first, let me introduce myself. Uh, I'm Dr. Nil Kumar Sarma. I'm working as a faculty in All India Institute of Medical Science, Raipur, uh, which is one of the uh, uh, largest uh, hospital in uh, Central India and one of the apex center in country. This uh, I'm not able to share my screen, John. Yes, have you done this before, uh, Neil? I thought you did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've done. I've done. I've. Uh, yeah, you see that at the bottom is a screen share of your yes. of the Zoom. You say share screen. There you go. Okay.
Yeah. It's yeah. coming. Yeah, you want to make it bigger, right? There you go. You you know what you're doing. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Now very it's good. okay. Yes, very good. Okay. So so we will be talking about uh, endoscopic endonasal approach for anterior skull vase meningiomas. As we all know, skull vase meningiomas uh, represent some of the most complex pathology uh, as encountered by us neurosurgeons, and uh, on account of their depth, invasion, and uh, vascularity, texture, and in relation to neurovascular uh, structures. So in this, we will discuss the technical nuances for performing extended endoscopic endonasal approach in a stepwise manner with the illustration from cadaveric dissections and which will be supplemented further by a surgical video and clinical case presentation. So we all know skull vase meningiomas <clears throat> uh, surgery has been uh, transformed by development of endoscopic endonasal approach. In the last few decades, advances in endoscopic skull vase surgery have allowed for improved overall outcome, overall patient outcome in patient and different technologies have helped us like uh, neuro navigation system advancement in uh, robust neural reconstruction technique, instrumentation, improved instrumentation. Th these factors has largely contributed to the growth of the surgery. So why do we need this approach? Question arises, why do we need this approach? Already we have uh, we have been operating these kind of tumors, anti-escal based meningiomas with transcranial surgery and uh, with the development of uh, <clears throat> supravro approaches. So there are certain factors, uh, certain advantages and disadvantages with, uh, with the, these, this kind of approach. So extensive soft tissue retraction and transcranial approach, as we all know, manipulation, new manipulation of neurovascular structures and limited access to central corridor, subchiasmatic space, cellar space and perforators. So that were the main uh, problem with transcranial approaches. So what are the advantages? their lack of brain retraction. We don't have to retract brain. We can directly access midline lesions. There is minimal manipulation of complex neurovascular structures, per se, uh, carotid artery, anterior communicating complex, and uh, optic apparatus and uh, nerve. And there is no uh, skin incision, comfortable recovery. And on top of that, it provides a wider closer view of surgical field, which allow better exposure. And we can visualize blind corners and detail visualization of main neurovascular structures. So these are the main advantages. And we can, and in, part, in a particular cases of meningioma, we can interrupt the uh, vascular supply in, at the beginning of operation. If we are going by transcranial approach, we cannot interrupt uh, vascular supply, which mainly come from uh, dura. And uh, there are high, high likelihood of uh, curing, at least theoretically, curing these meningiomas, not only the dura, but also bone. At the base of tumor is removed during this approach. And it ensure complete removal of remnant that lie below the optic nerve. And it's very, that otherwise that would have been very difficult to remove with a transcranial approach. And facilitate complete uh, bilateral optic canal decompression in case of uh, optic canal is involved and bone can be removed. So now we, if we come to indication, what are the indications and contraindication for skull vase uh, men, uh, meningiomas approaching by an extended endoscopic endonasal approach. So uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, frankly speaking, there, as, as of now, there are no contraindication for approaching these lesions by extended endoscopic approach. But there are certain limitations that we, have, we need to take into account. Uh, radiologically, we, we need to study radiology very carefully and surgeon experience has to be taken into account. They, these are very two important factors. So uh, as per se, lesion uh, which are more than three, three, three centimeter extending laterally beyond optic nerve, encasement of uh, uh, neurovascular structures. So these are relative contraindication for these, uh, these, uh, these kind of approaches. So virtually any kind of uh, lesion in anterior skull base, middle and posterior cranial fossa can be approached with uh, uh, endoscopic skull base approaches. And close attention must be paid to lateral extent of tumor. And uh, as, as I said earlier, surgeon experience is very pertinent in uh, this kind of uh, approaches. So transplanum approach. So transplanum approach is defined by removal of uh, uh, planum and part of tuberculum cellae. So, uh, what are the lateral lateral uh, limitations and, and, and anterior posterior limitation and sagittal? 
so a lateral this, this is dictated by lateral ocr and on bilaterally we need to expose from carotid to carotid and entero posteriorly sagittally it is dictated by involvement of by uh, uh, by tumor extension so these are cadaveric uh, uh, study uh, images from cadaveric study basically so here we can see uh, what is the view after bilateral spinoidotomy and posterior septic generous posterior septectomy so here we can see panoramic view of uh, cella and plenum and tuberculum cella uh, this is clival rhesus this is uh, part of cella this is chiasmatic sulcus this is carotid protuberance this is lateral optico carotid rhesus this is medial optico carotid rhesus and this is optic protuberance this is part of plenum this is tuberculum cellae so uh, th this is the panoramic view after bilateral spinoidotomy and this is here we have taken advantage of cadaveric dissection that much exposure is actually not required uh, for doing this kind these kind of surgeries here uh, uh, this is the view after removing uh, bone here we can see dura uh, 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 cella and uh, this is clinoidal carotid of this optic optic canal and this is plenum dura and this is limbus so our exposure is from lateral ocr to lateral ocr and this sagittal plane exposure is dictated by involvement of how much tumor uh, how much part of this bone we need to remove means extent of uh, tumor uh, if tumor is not involving cella so, so we we don't we don't have to remove uh, this part this part of uh, cella in fact this can uh, work as a guide to surgeon uh, like a uh, true north pole so this is again we have taken advantage of cadaveric dissection uh, this is the panoramic view after removing uh, dura mater this is pituitary gland this is uh, carotids this is carotid on both side this is chiasm this is optic nerve and here we can see ophthalmic artery bilaterally this is ophthalmic artery this side is ophthalmic artery uh, posterior circulation also seen basilar artery this is anterior circle anterior cerebral artery and uh, anterior uh, communicating complex this is gyrus rectus so here we can see panoramic view uh, after removal of dura and this is the view we should see after removal of our tumor this is the view this is pituitary gland and uh, the dura mater over there this is uh, pituitary stalk here we can see carotid bilaterally uh, this is chiasm this is optic nerve bilaterally this is aca acon complex this is gyral rectus this is uh, a recurrent artery of ophthalmic on both sides so this is the view we should see after removal of tumor so now coming to general surgical strategy uh, i mean what is our goal uh, wh what we are doing by endoscopic approach so basically by doing endoscopic endoscopic uh, extended endoscopic approach we are converting a skull vase meningioma to a convexity meningioma in, in convexity meningioma what we do first we uh, approach bone then dura mater and then tumor here also we are following same strategy sequential and systematic dissection in first, in layers first we are approaching bone then dura mater and then capsule and then we are internally decompressing so this is the actually basic advantage of uh, this surgery in beginning of the surgery only we can devascularize the tumor so once the approach is performed the skull vase as tumors are virtually converted into convexity meningiomas and all principles of micro dissections that uh, all those principles are same uh, like transcranial surgery so this is uh, one clinical case uh, this is one uh, uh, large tumor around 3 to 3 4, uh, 3 to 3.2 cm uh, 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 arising from a part of plenum and uh, tumor is uh, compressing uh, approaching to uh, third ventricle superiorly and here we can see it seems like the vessel is encased but when i uh, evaluated uh, 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 properly in uh, console these vessels were pushed aside they were not involved so here we can see here we can see vessels so tumor is homogeneously enhancing large tumor 3 to 3 4 3 3 to 3.5 and uh, uh, it's, it's filling a uh, uh, the pituitary fossa also posterior reaching up to posterior fossa so this is surgical video of uh, this case anybody has any question please so this is surgical video of uh, this case this same tumor pre operative and post operative picture post operative mri at 6 month uh, showing complete removal
So basically, our procedure start the, here. We can see spinoid ostia. This is natural opening in spinoid. So basically, our pro procedure is uh, this nasal. We have skipped nasal stress directly. We are coming to uh, spinoid stress. So here we are seeing natural entry in spinoid uh, that is spinoid ostia. So bilateral spinoid ostia need to be removed circumferentially. An anterior inferior wall of spinoid uh, sinus that has to be removed. So this is the view after removing, uh, doing a generous uh, spinoidotomy and uh, posterior septectomy. And here drilling being done uh, of uh, uh, tuberculum and planum part. And we need to do drilling with the uh, uh, gentle and uh, uh, round, uh, round uh, burr with copious uh, irrigation. Copious irrigation is required because the heat generated by this procedure can uh, injure uh, optic, uh, optic nerve. So this is drilling being, uh, being done of tuberculum and uh, cellar part. And once uh, one, one particular difference we need to understand while, while doing routine pit, uh, pituitary surgeries, in pituitary surgery, cell is widened. So cell R4 will be quite thin, thin down. Just sometimes just uh, that will be, sometimes that will be like XL and just we need to take it out. In, uh, in particularly in case of meningiomas, one will be hyperostotic, it will be vascular. So we need to do, uh, uh, sometimes we need to do extensive drilling for these kind of tumors. So drilling is been done and bone has been removed. There is a dural, uh, uh, dural opening here. Uh, uh, dura has been opened and other thing, uh, this, this part of intercavernous sinus, we need to take it control in uh, beginning of surgery only because otherwise later it will keep uh, some some bleeding will be there throughout the procedure. So here tumor has been seen after dural opening. We can see tumor over here, and tumor is being compressed, uh, being being decompressed with the uh, cavitron ultrasonic aspirator. Uh, sorry, sir, some tumor is being decompressed with the ultrasonic aspirator here. So here, here we can see uh, anterior cerebral arteries here. Anterior cerebral arteries are coming into picture. Here, here we can see A1, A2, and ACOM. So there is a, a sharp dissection. We need to do sharp dissection. This uh, Barknard bands, bands are being cut. Here we can see optic nerve here. There we can see how this uh, severely it's compromised and stressed uh, optic nerve. So tumor is being decompressed with the combination of uh, sharp dissector. Both ACA and uh, uh, recurrent RTO from nerve bilaterally are beautifully seen. So tumor is being decompressed internally. Here we can see optic chiasm. So again, this again, our dissection is being done. So we need to dissect uh, extra uh, arachnoidally uh, all around the tumor after decompression. So tumor is being uh, removed from opposite side of the sub dissection. There's some problem actually, continuously it's... Yeah, tumor is being dissected. There, is, there we can see perforator over there. So we need to dissect from that perforator also. Yeah, tumor is being delivered from opposite side. There again, we have to do sharp dissection. So basically, what are the tricks uh, for this kind of surgery? Uh, we need to decompress internally. Vascularity will be decreased significantly as we are approaching. We are de devascularizing tumor and uh, at the beginning of surgery only.
So here beautifully, beautifully we can see optic nerve, optic chias, and uh, bilateral uh, A2, A1, uh, uh, proximal AC, anterior cerebral artery, distal anterior cerebral artery, and anterior communicating artery, and both side recurrent artery of ulna. Here tumor is being delivered after dissection. Tumor has been removed from this side. So the, what, what we saw uh, 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 after this cadaveric dissection, that again, same picture we, we should see here after complete removal of tumor. So we are seeing same picture. We can compare from the, the, those images. We can see we can see bilateral ACA, A1, uh, a bilateral A2, whole AC apparatus, bilateral optic nerve, chiasm, pituitary stalk. So all other is, all those structures we can see here. Any question? So the, this is the surgical video. Here we can see uh, both the optic nerve, this side, this side, a whole tumor has been removed. And uh, all uh, this here we can see part of uh, 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 frontal lobe varus rectus and bilateral ACA recurrent artery of ulnar on both sides and both A2. So these are pre-op images, post-op images. MRI at six months, there is no uh, 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 residual or recurrence at six months with improved visual outcome. These are images, uh, post-op images of uh, axial and uh, coronal section. The post op at six months. So, take home message is we need to understand intracranial uh, when we compare intracranial and uh, endoscopic approaches. So, it's not about superiority or inferiority. We need to understand that it's not about superiority or inferiority, it's about right indication. Right indication, right patient. We need to in, uh, incorporate such experience in that. The, the key to success of this minimally excess but maximally aggressive is in careful patient selection. The ideal approach for the patient should be selected, taken into account the tumor anatomy with special attention to size and lateral extension and surgeon experience. And of course, dural, robust dural reconstruction, we do uh, multi-layered reconstruction using facial ATA and uh, pedicle nasoceptal flap. And pedicle, these vascular flap, they have dramatically reduced CSF uh, leak postoperatively. And then, then this, as we all know, growing interest is uh, over uh, major progress over uh, recent year and a large number of anatomical studies and uh, uh, robust dural reconstruction technique. Uh, all those things have uh, supplemented and uh, more and more people are choosing for this kind of approach. So what, what uh, should be our take home message? We should carefully, we should choose our patient. We should take into account radiology tumor more than three to three point five percent at, at least in at least in beginning at least in beginning in, in initial stages when uh, we should uh, we should be very careful while choosing patient uh, as such there is no contraindication if surgeon is more experienced he can uh, basically we divide this kind of tumor into three groups hello yes we can uh, hear you yes. yeah, yeah. basically we divide this kind of tumor in three groups uh, one when there is where, where there is cortical cuff is present. If cortical cuff is present, we can go ahead with the endoscopic surgery. If there is no cortical cuff and uh, uh, vas neurovascular structures are there on tumor capsule, but that those can be dissected, we can go ahead with tra trans uh, endoscopic surgery. And if neurovascular structure are encased, then that is a relative contraindication. That is a relative contraindication, not absolute contraindication for going these kind of approaches. And uh, we need to take into account how much tumor is extending beyond uh, optic, uh, bilateral optic corridor. We need to take into account uh, carotid anatomy. If suppose if there is a kissing carotid, we cannot operate by this approach. So all those factors we need to take into account. And, and as I said earlier, there is no superiority as of now. A lot, lot of studies are coming up. A lot of uh, literature is uh, supporting uh, one or other approaches. But uh, there are a lot of studies has to come. We need to we need to see long term outcome of uh, endoscopic extended, extended endoscopic approaches. We need to see long term outcome. And uh, uh, as I said, uh, uh, surgeon experience definitely matters in these kind of approaches. So, any questions? 
Okay, very good. Thank you very much, Anil. Okay, like uh, you can, if you have a question, you can either ask it or yeah, yeah. text it. Text it. Uh, I, uh, we found from experience that sometimes people uh, uh, are more comfortable with texting, which certainly is welcome. Uh, okay. What percentage of your practice is is endoscopy uh, when you're when you're practicing uh, full time? Anil. Yeah, I'm practicing as a faculty in All India Institute of Medical Science, Raipur. Here. I'm with particular interest in complex pelvis and endoscopic surgeries and complex CVS surgeries. Okay. Uh, I don't know India. How far are, are you from uh, New Delhi? Yeah, you, you, yeah it's, it's uh, just a one and a half hour flight from Delhi. Oh, okay. So not too far. A lot of flights are there from Delhi. Okay, if there are no comments or questions, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Uh, Neil, and then we'll, we're going to edit this, and uh, we'll send you with the edited copy. Hello? Yes, yes, uh, we'll send you the edited copy, doctor. Yeah, 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 thank you, thank you. And, okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Okay, okay we'll stop recording there. Very good. Uh, I think there is no question, I think. Uh, uh, I don't see any, no. No, I'm we're all, we're still live on YouTube, uh, although it's not <clears throat> being recorded. Uh, mm -hmm. Are you there, Ashwin? You want to meet uh, Neil? I don't know. Let's see here where you are. Maybe Ashwin stepped away. Uh, okay, very good. Okay. Yeah, thank you. We'll be, we'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Bye-bye.